Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the new edition of Voices in Action. Today, BID Academy welcomes Eliza Reid, journalist, editor, and the First Lady of Iceland. Para aquellos invitados conectados de manera virtual, contamos con interpretación al español. For those connected to the event via our social media platforms, please look out for the links we will post in the chat to connect to the different languages. Now, I would like to introduce our host, Ana Maria Ibáñez, Principal Econom Economics Advisor of the Vice Presidency for Sectors and Knowledge at the Inter-American Development Bank. Ana Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. So, and thank you so much for joining us today. It is really a great pleasure to host this new edition of Voices in Action, a series of talks by BID Academy. BID Academy is the IDB Group's knowledge and learning platform to address the development challenges of Latin America and the Caribbean. Voices in Action aims to inspire and to raise awareness on the latest and most urgent development topics shaping the future of the region such as gender equality, which I'm thrilled to discuss today with Eliza Ray, right? journalist, entrepreneur, and first lady of Iceland. 132 years is the time that it will take those to close the global gender gap at the current rate of progress, according to the 2022 World Economic Forum Gender Report. Before the pandemic, this, pa this gap was supposed to close in 100 years meaning that the pandemic reversed a little more than 30% of the programs we had achieved thus far. Latin America and the Caribbean ranks third of all regions after North America and Europe, having bridged its gender gap with a 72.6% of progress. Iceland, however, it's the only economy to have closed more than 90% of its gender gap, and for 13 years in a row, it's the world's most gender equal country. Reading Eliza's book on what Iceland has accomplished in terms of gender equality helped me to understand better the many barriers in the region that need to be overcome to improve women's life and close gender gaps, but also let me, uh, left me with a glimpse of hope. If women come together, speak up, and claim their place in society, we can achieve equality at a more, at a more rapid pace. Let me provide you with some figures for luck before giving the floor to Eliza. In 2021, female labor participation in LAC was 50%, compared to 84% in Iceland. Women that do work in LAC do it generally part-time, with lower salaries than men, and are highly concentrated in traditionally female sectors, such as education and health. To fight these same issues, for the past few decades, Iceland has focused on putting in place laws and policies aimed at closing gender gaps. In 2018, Iceland introduced the first law in the world that requires companies with more than 25 employees to prove that they pay men and women equally for a job of equal value. It has a quota demanding that 30% of company boards to be women. And parents have equal parent leave. 180 days each. In LAC, the most generous country only provides 40 days of paid leave to fathers. Clearly, Iceland is on a great path to reach gender equality. And there is a lot that LAC can learn from it. To have a better understanding of how Iceland got to this point, we have Eliza Wright to share some of the research she made on this matter to write the book Secrets of the Sprachar, Iceland Extraordinary Woman and How They Are Changing the World. Welcome, Eliza. We are delighted to have you here. After listening to Eliza's presentation on Iceland Extraordinary Woman, we will have a conversation with her. And I want to invite our audience in person and online to be ready to join in with questions. For those who are following our conversation virtually, you can use the chat to send your comments and questions. Eliza, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, and greetings to all of you from a very uh, rainy and wet Reykjavik, Iceland this afternoon here. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak with you here today. And I do have a, a short presentation uh, with just some interesting pictures that I can use to give you a little bit of an introduction to my personal story, which has a bit of relevance uh, to this topic and to my book. 
and to Iceland overall. But really what I want to do is be able to have a good dialogue with you over the next uh, and until the top of the hour. So I'll try not to talk for too long, just to give you a bit of a flavor and an introduction. And then I'm happy to answer a lot of questions. So I'm just going to share with you now my screen and my presentation. I am not a technical expert, but I'm hoping that this is all working out very well. There we go. Um, and you should see a blank blue screen now. I'm hoping that that is working. So uh, I, my, my talk is a little bit based on my book, which I called Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World. And most of you, or I'm sure all of you, have never heard of this word sprakar before. That is because it is a very old and obscure Icelandic word that actually means outstanding women. And the fact that I uh, discovered this word, it was, it was sort of out of use and I'm trying to bring it back into fashion. But the fact that the Icelandic language has a word that is used to describe exclusively women in exclusively positive terms, I think also says something about the state of gender equality in my country and the importance uh, of, of which we see this issue going forward. I'm going to start, though, with a little bit of an introduction to myself, because this is a sort of thread that runs throughout the story, and hopefully my experience can be something that inspires people overall, but I'll try not to make it too, too long for you. As you can maybe hear from my accent, I'm not originally from Iceland. I grew up on a very small farm in Canada, uh, also from North America. There's a whole lot of pictures that you should be able to see on your screen there from it. And when I finished uh, my, my high school education, I moved to the big city in Canada, to Toronto, to take a degree in international relations. Then I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I went to the UK and completed a master's degree in history at Oxford University. And at that university, I met a very handsome and charming and funny man from Iceland. Uh, we fell in love, uh, traveled to Iceland, and we moved together to the country in 2003. And then I set up a life for myself and I founded, among other things, this uh, event called the Iceland Writers Retreat, where we teach writing workshops to people and, and set up a whole organization. Good me, my husband and I got married and we had four children in just under six years. And if any of you have children, uh, more than one child know, you might recognize this kind of a photo where it's virtually impossible to get a nice image of everybody together. And we live together in this tiny little house about a uh, thousand square feet 100 square meters in uh in the western part of Reykjavik and this was a great life for us and my husband was teaching history and we were very busy and we never slept and then there was a political crisis in 2016 and my husband who is a historian by profession was called to be the sort of neutral pundit on the television and he did such a good job that people started suggesting that he run for president of the country as there were outstanding elections and he decided literally within about a week to do so. And he became elected president in June of 2016. And I therefore became the country's first lady. This is the traditional uh, clothing that is worn for uh, high and important occasions. And it takes as long to put on as it looks like from that picture. <laughs> so, so I've had this pleasure of serving uh, as first lady of my adopted home since the summer of 2016. And I will come back to that at the end of, of this talk. It becomes a little bit relevant but I'll give you a bit of an introduction to Iceland. Um, maybe, I'm not sure how many of you have visited. Uh, we don't really have any direct flights to the LAC area, but we do to the United States and Canada. And I would encourage a lot of you to, to come and see us sometime. We always, when you do Iceland presentations, you have to include a lot of natural wonder shots because uh, the, the landscape and the nature in Iceland is, is really beautiful. We are a small island in the North Atlantic with a tiny population. It's 350,000 people, which presents to us both opportunities and challenges, obviously. We are one of only two countries in the world that has no military, uh, the other country being uh, in your region, it's Costa Rica. But Iceland ranks as the world's third happiest country, as the world's most peaceful country, one of the highest standards of living in the world and longest life expectancies. And as Anna Maria mentioned, for the last 13 years, we've topped the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index for the past yeah, 13 years, which means we haven't closed the gender gap yet, which we're very aware of, but we are the closest of all the countries to doing so. 
The photo at the bottom there that you see is a photo of me with uh, former Icelandic president, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir. She was the world's first democratically elected female head of state. And she served as president of Iceland from 1980 to 1996. So there was an entire generation of people who grew up at that time who thought that maybe it wasn't possible for boys to become presidents because they'd only seen a female president before. So I decided uh, a couple of years ago that I wanted to write a story about my adopted homeland. I wanted to explore why it was that things were going reasonably well for us in Iceland in terms of gender equality and what it was that it was doing, what it means to be a woman who is a mother or an entrepreneur or a banker or a farmer or a soccer player or a musician or all these other professions. And rather than write a sort of academic textbook, I wanted to really just paint a, a funny and warm portrait of a country where we as a society and this is, I think, a really important message, have passed the tipping point as to whether or not working to achieve greater gender equality is something important, but how we are going to get there. Because we are realizing, and all of the research and information shows us, that the more gender equal a society is, the longer living, the more peaceful, the more productive, the happier it is for all of its population. So gender equality is not something that we see as something that is uh, a zero-sum game. It's not something that is benefiting women at the expense of men, for example. It's something that is raising up the bar for everybody in society and hopefully allowing everybody to live to their full potential. So I wanted to explore that, and I spoke to almost 40 different women through all walks of life in the country, and not necessarily the first or the most famous women, but really just regular everyday women to see what kind of messages we could get from them. And I won't go through all of them now. I don't have enough time to, to do that in the presentation, but I'm happy to talk about um, some of them more specifically if you want. But effectively, there were sort of three main areas. And again, I can answer them in more detail. One, I'll move into it right away, actually. These are some of the women that I spoke to, the, the sprakar or the outstanding women that I spoke to in my book who work in different fields. One were the idea of what we are doing as a society to help further gender equality. So by there I'm talking what I would say are sort of top-down approaches to uh, helping speed the process along. And that really uh, surrounds legislation. So some of that has to do with this idea that all of these things that Anna Maria mentioned in the introduction to do with um, parental leave that is provided to both parents. The photo that you see there is actually of my, my husband. I don't know. I don't know that I told him I put a topless photo of him in my presentation, but uh, it's him teaching uh, in, in baby swimming classes for one of our children when he was young. It's We have a big swimming pool culture in Iceland. So he took our, our son swimming and uh, the parental leave policy that is paid for by the government is provided to everybody. And now it's at the point where each parent gets five months of paid parental leave and then a second section that they can switch between them. Uh, it's called use it or lose it meaning that uh, not one parent can't take all of the leave. And that, of course, encourages generally fathers to be taking a lot of parental leave as well, which has great benefits later on. Uh, we also have these quotas for the boards of publicly traded companies where uh, we, we need to make sure that there is more gender parity on those boards. Although an area where we really need to improve are seeing more women actually in the C-suite and, and running companies and investing in companies and being invested in. But these uh, legislative, um, these laws are, are quite important, I think, in terms of pushing everything through. But as I, as I say in this slide, uh, I'll, I'll say it out loud too, because I know it's being interpreted into to Spanish, uh, a legislative framework that encourages gender equality is important, but it isn't enough on its own. And then I think we need a lot of areas where really together we can fight for more inclusivity, we can fight for more legislation and improving things. And, and that's what I call this sort of mixture approach of, of top down, bottom up. And some of the examples that I include here, these are more people that I speak to in my book. Uh, the 
first, uh, our, our highest scoring football player, Margaret Laura, uh, who, who played professionally uh, football or soccer in Europe and also here. Um, obviously, we know that in sports is an area where there's a huge gender gap. And it's an area where we as consumers of sports and arts and culture and media need to, what I say, wear our gender equality glasses all the time. So we need to be paying attention if we're reading a diverse range of books or listening to a diverse range of music, if we're going to see sporting events uh, by, by men as, as much as women. Um, the way that that works from a societal level then is how, for example, our national teams in sports are generally paid the same bonuses as men are. So it's, it's one way of trying to, to level the playing field. I also talk a lot about fighting for more inclusive laws, again, so that we can be really uh, inclusive and all encompassing in terms of who we are working to uh, to provide more opportunities and create greater equitability for. So the person you see on the right in the photo there is, is a person called Ugla Stefania, who is a trans rights activist in Iceland. Iceland uh, of the OECD countries is the most open to the LGBTQ community, but it's certainly an area that we need to remain vigilant in and we really need to continue in. And we've made a lot of strides recently especially when it comes to the rights of trans people in terms of enshrining their rights into laws here. Uh, and then I talk a little bit about taking up space that the four women at the bottom are all women who work in various media sectors in Iceland, whether online, print, television. And I talk a little bit about how we uh, portray women in the media, how often we talk about women in the media, how we talk about the in the comment section and the effects that that, that has on the, the gender equality fight. Again, the, the point being here that we need to that we need to be very inclusive in our definition of how we are working towards achieving greater equality. And then thirdly, I, I talk a little bit through various interviews about the idea of what we can each do as individuals. Because I think if if we have bought into this idea that working towards greater equality is something that is going to benefit everybody and it's going to benefit us. It also seems like a huge challenge. We see that we need to remain vigilant, that things that are outside of our control, such as the COVID pandemic, can really set things back. The, the pandemic set the number of years before we'll achieve uh, global gender equality back by an entire generation. So we need to remain vigilant. And I think it's a little bit like the climate crisis. You know, I think that that sometimes it's easy to feel like, what can I as an individual do? Well, how can I make a difference that will help? And there's a lot of ways in which I think we can make a difference that go beyond just saying, try to elect officials who will implement um, laws that will further this. Um, and some of the messages I have through people that I speak with are, for example, ideas like pushing your comfort zones you can and and therefore being being role models the, the group of women there on the right are called the jellyfish who are a group of women who swam across the english channel to raise money for charity and spent a lot of time training to do that the photo actually is taken there in reykjavik and reykjavik is the world's northernmost capital city and uh they they still went swimming there out in the sea uh, where we have the sea swimming beach and it's pretty cold and it's really extremely cold uh, by the standards that you were used to I also spoke to a fishing captain. You can see this woman, Haldora. And I, again, I just talked about this idea of, of, of following your dreams and, um, and uh, trying to really stretch, stretch your own comfort zone and being role models. And that's, I think, a really important message. This idea that we are all role models in some senses, whether we are role models in our own schools, in our own societies, uh, in our places of worship, in our families. And it's really up to us whether we wanna be positive role models or negative role models. And that's where this photo that you might remember from the beginning of the talk comes up again. And there's a big theme there that, you know, in 2016, all of a sudden I became first lady of Iceland, had this incredible honor. But all of a sudden I was also nationally known because of something that my husband had achieved. And so I became primarily known as Goodney's wife rather than as myself, which I found a very strange thing. And even though it's an incredible privilege to be able to serve in, in this role, it also felt very strange for my identity in terms of in, in terms of sort of carving out an idea of who I was as a person. And I think as a woman and, and someone who feels very strongly about greater gender equality. I think that's something that we need to be doing. And I thought at first, well, I can't talk about this very much using my platform as first lady because 
there's too much irony there. It was my husband who got elected. He ran for office. He's the one who's serving as president. Even though people now maybe listen a bit more to what I'm saying, it, there's too much irony in talking about gender for that. But then I got over that idea. And I thought, you know, really, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to do something. And so I wrote a piece in the New York Times uh, a few years ago. They wrote the title for this article, um, all about the, the idea of what it is to be serving in this kind of a role means. And so in my book, there's kind of a narrative thread and a message about this idea of making the most of unexpected opportunities, of encouraging people to speak up and to use our voices and to try to give this proverbial microphone to other people who may not have the same uh, platform or audience to allow them to use their voices so that we can really be hearing uh, uh, more of a diversity of, of viewpoints somewhere. And, uh, and, and the message there really being that, you know, it's going well for us here in Iceland, but we don't have some unique formula or patent or recipe for how to do this. Um, it's just taken a lot of hard work. We have some fortunate um, scenarios and other countries have other ones, but it's something that uh, we find is working broadly speaking for everybody in society and that we want to continue to be able to do. And, and hopefully the book really just inspires people on an everyday level to be able to uh, to live life to their full potential and use their, use their voices. And these are some more of the, the photos that people that I spoke to. And now I'm going to leave the presentation. There we go. And, uh, and, and, and hopefully, oh, I see someone. Now we can see the images in PowerPoint. I didn't look at the message until now, but hopefully everybody could see it and I'm happy to answer some questions. Eliza, thank you very much for a very interesting and fascinating presentation. It was great to see the faces of the stories that, that you describe in the chapter. So I really like those pictures and the presentation. Uh, for all of us, The Secrets of the Sprachar is really an interesting book and a great reading and give us a lot of food for thought. I am sure that the audience has lots of questions for you, but before I open it to them, I would like to start with a few of my own. And, mm -hmm. and first, I would like to summarize your message, because, because I think it's very important. And if we want to achieve gender equality, we really need to work on many dimensions. First, top down, bottom down, and the coordination between these two, two levels. But also, it's very important to help society shift percep perceptions and talk about gender equality. And what I love more about the book is the, the strength of the woman that really tried to change things and the sorority that, is in, that exists in, in Iceland about it. Uh, and I love that part about the book because women are always getting together and seeing how to change things. So each of us can make a difference, men can make a difference as well, and I think that's also a very important um, message about the book. So you already told us uh, your story, you're an entrepreneur, a journalist, an author, a, an immigrant, a mother of four, and the first lady of Iceland. With all these personal and professional experiences, could you please share with us, besides what you already told, what drove you to write about gender equality instead of other topics that are close to your heart? What mm -hmm. made you decide to talk about gender equality? And I would add, what made you to decide to have that voice for all women mm -hmm. uh, and to help improve gender equality around the world and not only mm -hmm. in Iceland? Thank you for that question. I think, you know, it's always been something that has interested me. I think even, even since I was a child, if I, and I, I come from really quite a, you know, I have a, a privileged background in terms of, of, of being educated and growing up in a very supportive family. And, and, and uh, nevertheless, I felt that there was some unfairness uh, sometimes in, in situations purely because of my gender. And, uh, and I'm the kind of person who sort of, I don't like unfairness. I don't think that's fair. So I, I, um, I always, you know, asked questions about these things and, and wondered about them. Then when I moved to Iceland again, I experienced being an immigrant to a new country, um, facing uh, prejudice sometimes because of my background or because I didn't speak the language and, 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 and trying to work to, to tackle that as well. And when I wanted to write the story, I also really wanted to just kind of write a love story to Iceland because I, I, I have 
felt very privileged and, and honored to have, have made my my home here for the last nearly two decades. And I kind of, I wanted to share that with people in the outside world. And I thought really that this was an interesting theme because, uh, you know, even though, I mean, many of the women that I interview in the book wouldn't describe themselves as feminists necessarily. I didn't want to write a big um, sort of uh, theory-based heavy book on that sort of thing. But I did want to just inspire people in their everyday lives, but also hopefully introduce them to some quirky or interesting things about a country that maybe people don't know very much about using using this theme. Um, because it's a theme that affects all of us. And it's a theme, I think, that that when we try to work towards greater equality in, in whatever way, that it's something that's going to improve uh, lives for everybody. And, and ultimately, of course, I ended up speaking just for uh, just just to women, but this is a huge issue for men as well. And and you know, there's why I included, for example, some of the photos in there of, of for example, my 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 husband uh, taking our son to the infant swimming class. Uh, the time that that fathers have, for instance, with their children on parental leave, is is invaluable and and creates such a strong bond between them and the children. Um, the statistics show that the divorce rates are lower for, for couples where fathers, heterosexual couples where fathers took their uh, paternity leave. And, um, and, and, you know, I haven't met a father yet here who said, oh, it's too bad I had to take paternity leave. I just wanted to go back to work. Um, you know, this is an area I think where if we can, if we can work in this dimension as well, you know, narrowing, broadening, uh, what I think in, in the world is very often an extremely narrow definition of, of masculinity, of, of what it's supposed to be to be a man, and, and that men who fall without outside of that very limited definition somehow also don't feel maybe like they can fully be themselves or contribute in the way that they want to contribute. And I think that that, that also is, is more limiting for us too. So, so hopefully some of these stories really just in, in inspire people to be living their own authentic lives and, and speaking up and it, it, you know, if that's another message, it is to say to stop having what what I think many women know specifically, and and I think people are aware of this this idea of an imposter syndrome of well, I can't speak up because I must be the only person that thinks this way, or or I will just be be made fun of, or uh, you know, I'm not an expert in this. I don't have a I don't have a right to talk about it, and just really encouraging people to to try to speak up when they can, and and I recognize. Of course, I'm saying that from this uh, incredible position of privilege. So, so it, it's also not fair for me to tell a lot of people you have to speak up because it's important to speak up because it is. It, it takes uh, a tremendous amount of bravery in many circumstances to be able to do that, and uh, and maybe it, it isn't as feasible for some people in circumstances. But if it isn't feasible for those people, that's all the more reason why the rest of us should be um, reminding people of that fact. Thank you. You mentioned something that's very important, and is that gender equality is not only going to improve the life of women, but also the life of men. And they would be able to enjoy their kids, they would be able to spend time with them, and that's going to improve society as a whole. While reading the book, I really tried to identify what drove, what drove these achievements and which are, uh, which are applicable to Latin America and the Caribbean. We see cultures, the culture was, was very important. Also sorority, the strong-willed woman in Iceland. Iceland, uh, you mentioned that several times in the book. Being a small state with a challenging geography are some of the many causes. Some are replicable, others are really not for other countries. For example, cultural changes are really slow. Can you please highlight one lesson from Iceland that could be replicated in a completely different context and could help us, uh, us accelerate the progress on gender equality in the region? That's an excellent question. I have to think off the top of my head here for one uh, specific example. Uh, I think uh, we need to see more, this is maybe hard, we need to see more women leaders and role models in different places. Um, this that cliche, you know, if we don't see it, we can't be it. And by that, I mean women running for public office, women uh, running companies, investing in companies, women on the television, and then also, you know, the subjects of interviews. So if you're watching the television and you're interviewing an expert. How many of the experts are women versus men? Just so we hear more of, of these voices. And I suppose uh, if you're listening, that isn't always applicable to you, but I would say to, 
the one tangible example, which I try to do, and I try to remind my kids of is, is also just seeing the world with the gender equality glasses. So where you are now in your, uh, in your work groups, in your environments, when you're organizing a presentation, when you're organizing a talk, is there diversity in, in the voices that are being represented? Is, is there diversity in the materials that you are reading for it? And I think these are small things, you know, but they always make a difference. I know, for example, my husband, when he is delivering, um, big speeches, opening parliament, uh, the New Year's Day address, these major sort of addresses. He uh, he loves to quote poetry um, or he loves to quote other stories from, from Icelanders in the news, but he always makes sure that he quotes an equal number of men and women. Because if he delivered a speech, I don't know that you would necessarily realize it until you thought, oh, he quoted three poems there, all of them were by men. And and it's 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 a very kind of subtle messaging that can go forward that all of a sudden we realize, oh, we didn't hear any women's voices. You know, it was delivered by a man, uh, mentioned other men, and uh, these are these are small things that I think can really add up to make a difference. Thank you, Liza. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open the floor here at the IDB or also in the virtual audience. Uh, but I want to ask one question that is very important for Latin America. In the book, you mentioned that one of the reasons why Iceland is ranked as number one on the list of countries closing gender gaps is the priority that the country has put into building an infrastructure for families. You showed this mm -hmm. in the presentation, which includes extended and paid parental leave, subsidized quality care for dependents, and work environments that understand care needs, among others. To this date, in Latin America and the Caribbean, very few countries have invested as much on, as Iceland on infrastructure for families. Mm -hmm. But more countries, especially after the pandemic, have realized the importance of putting uh, in place care systems. For, from your research on the matter and your knowledge of the country, when and how Iceland decided to put so much emphasis mm -hmm. in investing heavily in uh, infrastructure for families? What can mm -hmm. the LAC region do and mm -hmm. learn from the Icelandic experience. I think this is something very important because it goes beyond culture. It go, it's a policy decision mm -hmm. that is very important mm -hmm. for women and really improves yeah. not only the lives of women, but of men and children as well. Mm -hmm. It is a really, as you say, it is, it is, it, it's a conscious decision and it doesn't happen overnight and, and people have to be persistent and it's not a, a women's decision. Um, you know, if you look at our parliament right now, for instance, we do have 47.5% women in parliament, so almost parity, not quite. But that also means that all of these previous governments that have implemented various laws and then improved them and enhanced them have been majority male-led governments that still realize that implementing these changes is going to be beneficial for everybody. And right. so, you know, there's all kinds of McKinsey studies and these sorts of things that can say on the bottom line how this is going to help. How, for instance, encouraging women to contribute more in the workforce, encouraging them to go you know, back to work after they've had children is going to contribute more to the economy. It just generates more tax income for the government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these didn't happen overnight, as I said. Uh, and I, I don't want to give you a, a history lesson on Iceland, um, but I'll point at a couple of moments that were very important in, in past history. One is, and I mentioned this in the book, uh, the Women's Day Off back in the 1970s and 1975, when 90% of the country's women decided to go on strike or not do their work for the day, whether that was paid work or unpaid work in the home. And many of them went downtown. And as you can imagine, the country shut down. Um, the, the, the flights weren't running because there was no flight attendants. The banks were closed. There were no bank tellers. The the stores sold out of, of hot dogs because that was what the fathers all thought that they could cook. And, and they all, you know, they sold out of hot dogs and everything uh, shut down. But that really also galvanized the country to show that that when 50 percent of the population isn't contributing to their maximum potential, you're really losing out as a society. Uh, it was only a few years later when we elected a female president. And around the same time as well, uh, the, the government started a women's party was formed. So it just ran female candidates. And people thought, this is ridiculous, it will never work. And they won a number of can seats in parliament after winning local elections, which also meant that the other parties realized that they needed to increase the number of women that they had running for office. And that all uh, helped and built up on itself. And then gradually there were more, as you said, laws put in place. We're a small country, as I said, we need, we need people to be working 
uh, in the economy if we can. We need people to be going back to work. And so that's why it's really important to, first of all, allow people the time to uh, build these strong relationships with their children. And we have a very high birth rate here in Iceland, uh, as far as high income countries are concerned. Uh, so it's a very sort of family friendly society. But then afterwards, we have this very enhanced and subsidized child care so that people can go in and feel comfortable uh, leaving their children uh, once once they return to work for both of them. And then that is also compounded with the fact that, you know, because more and more people do this, it's more and more normal. So if you're in an office job and you said, oh, my child got the chicken pox, I, I can't come in today or I have to go to a dance recital for my son. That's that's sort of acceptable because people realize that that's just what what happens in a society where many people have have children. Thank you very much. And the story about uh, the strike in 1974 is really fascinating. What happened in the country mm -hmm. and the decision of women to do the strike and organize it. I open the floor here for questions at the audience at the IDB and for the uh, virtual audience. Are there any questions? Hello. Um, my question would be if there are any unconscious biases um, either you or your team have encountered during your work towards gender equality. That's a great question. Thank you. And absolutely. Uh, we all have biases. Uh, we all have prejudices. Uh, I, I think the idea, I think a big thing is trying to acknowledge that that is the case so that we can, you know, acknowledging that that exists that nobody is perfect is the best way of, of improving and, and moving forward, I think. And I, I try very hard in the book sometimes also to point out the areas where in Iceland we can be doing better. Um, one of those I think has to do with uh, people of foreign origin uh, to, to remind people here that, that working towards greater gender equality does not mean just working towards one elite group of uh Uh, ethnically Icelandic uh, women, but it really involves including people of foreign origin, people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's very important to me. And another huge area, which I do address in the book as well, is the idea of gender-based violence and, and domestic violence, because uh, we have that obviously in Iceland too. And I don't think that you can have a gender equal country when you still have uh, incidences of, of gender-based violence. And that's something that we really need to be uh, continuing to tackle and, and to work on. Here, please. And then you. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. How do you think equity plays a role um, when you're mentioning about gender equality and your efforts? How, how does equity play a role? In what you yeah, think? I mean, I think uh, I, I probably unfairly, you know, this idea of equity and quality, it's, it's, it's very important. And I think that that's something that I, I work on maybe here in Iceland as well to remind people that uh, we don't all start off on the same point on the playing field. And we also need to work, you know, part of the whole thing is to, is to work to um, elevate the situation for everybody. And I think um Now I've forgotten the word off the top of my head. Um, I'm going to look for a second. I'll wake up in the night and remember what the exact word was. Um, <laughs> but I, but I mean, I my book is very uh, oh intersectional. This is a, it's a, it's a, such a sort of technical term. I felt like that I hadn't used a lot. Um, but I really wanted to include that a lot in my book. This intersectionality of uh, gender and race and ethnicity and background, because I think that that is, is very important. And it's something I wanted to highlight as well, because I think many people say, oh, Iceland, it also works because it's such a homogeneous country and everybody is the same and everybody has the same background and therefore, you know, the same perspectives that makes it easier. And, um, I tried to make the point that it's, it's one, it's less homogeneous than I think people think that it is. And, and two, you know, that's exactly my point. We can't say we're working towards greater equality. And then if you're a trans woman, you have a lot less rights. Or if you're a woman of color, you you have a lot less opportunity. So we have to be really uh, conscious of of the um, of working towards being inclusive and in, in how we're seeing this. I hope that answers your question. We have here one in, in the audience and then Fernanda will, will give us some, some questions okay. for, from the virtual audience. Please go ahead. 
Thank you, Elisa. Um, I have a question related to, um, well, in, in Latin America, we've seen that in some cases, even though we have achieved, for example, the rights to legalize abortion or some other rights to gender equality, then at some point we can see some waves that challenge these rights. So mm -hmm. I don't know if in Iceland you have seen uh, that, that at some point you have had that fear and if that is so, uh, if that is true, what have you done to kind of strength or uh, protect the rights that you have already achieved for women? Mm -hmm. That's and an excellent I may, question. I may add uh, to that question that I think is very important. We have many instances where the law is passed and, and equality or abortion rights are, are, are uh, become a law, but the mm -hmm. culture doesn't change. And so yeah. there are many invisible obstacles for that law to be put in place. Uh, I think that's, and that happens a lot in our region. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I mean, I completely agree. Uh, and it happens in Iceland. You know, I, I mentioned at the end of the book, a scenario that happened in 2018, where a number of elected members of parliament uh, went to a bar, uh, had too much to drink and started um, talking and using bad language that I'm not going to use right now about all of their female colleagues, cabinet ministers, other people. Uh, when I wrote the book, they were all still sitting members of parliament, never had to resign or anything. Uh, it, during the COVID pandemic, the number of reports of gender-based violence and domestic violence increased in Iceland as it did throughout the rest of the world. And we absolutely see that. Uh, I know the issue of abortion rights, for instance, is very much in the global scene now because of what's happening in the United States. Um, it, that specific issue is not, I would say, uh, high on the discussion list within Iceland, um, but they did update the, the abortion laws last year. Uh, you used to have to have the approval of two doctors and now you don't need that anymore, but it's, it's not the sort of same uh, cultural topic. But for example, this law on the boards of publicly traded companies that I mentioned that was implemented in 2006 numbering. And uh, it's, it, it did change some, but if you already had a board before the law passed, it didn't apply. So it didn't happen quite as quickly. Uh, and they're very, you know, it hasn't translated through to the rest of the workplace. So you're right. It's not enough to just pass a law and say, we're taking that box. We thought about it. And if it doesn't happen, it's not our problem. Um, it's, it's very often like you see uh, companies that have a very uneven gender balance in an area. And then they'll say, well, it's women don't apply. It's not our fault. It's because the women, they don't apply. Um, but they don't kind of take the step and look further to say, oh, are they not applying because women are more likely to not apply for a job unless they tick every single box that's required, whereas men tend to say, yeah, I'll be great in that. And then they uh, apply and, and, and therefore examine the, the, the vocabulary that they use and the tone in which they're writing. So uh, it is something that we need to look at. And again, I think that goes back to that message of, I think in some areas, you know, uh, making sure convincing people that this is something that is a benefit to everybody so that uh, maybe some people don't don't see it as a threat don't see it as something that is trying to take something away from them really something that is trying to elevate it for everybody else and and therefore and to remain vigilant because absolutely we can't just pass a law and say that's good enough and we can't let things slide and it's it's tiring to do that you know and it's very easy to say this small thing happened, uh, this discussion happened, I heard this or that, and, you know, let's just forget about it. Because if I complained every time this thing happened, nothing, you know, I wouldn't get nothing else done. And um, I think I think we do need to remain vigilant and talk about things or else the, the sort of broader culture is never going to change. Fernanda has a question from the audience, a virtual audience. <laughs> Please go ahead. It's from Ana Santiago. She's asking, what are your suggestions and experiences about how to raise a voice to make the future of our daughters a more actable one? That's a great question. And I have, you know, I don't know if you saw from the picture, I have three sons and then one daughter. So it's something that I feel very strongly about because as you say, I think, I think we focused a lot these days on, on women. If we're talking about raising our children, uh, that we say we t we tell our girls that they're so strong and they're so smart and 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 I think many of us we think about that already. But are we thinking about the men as much to say, hey guys, if you're really sad about something, you should also cry about it. Uh, you, you know, not to stop expressing your feelings or or shutting down these more sort of quote unquote feminine qualities. 
But I think one of the things that I try to impress upon my boys who are still quite young is this idea that as they get older, they will be in environments um, in the proverbial locker room where they will hear or witness something unacceptable, you know, a joke, a saying, people trying to do things, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I try to say to them, I, you know, you guys aren't going to do that, but you will undoubtedly see it. And you have to have the courage to stand up and say, it's not okay to say, you can't treat other people that way, or that wasn't a funny joke, or this isn't appropriate. And boy, that's hard to do with your peers and with your friends when you're younger. I don't know that I would have have the courage to do it, but I think that that is very important because, uh, you know, I'm not going to be in the locker room saying that. And I'm especially because I'm a mom, I'm incredibly uncool, obviously. But while my children, you know, are maybe listening to me a little bit now, that's something that I that I really try to do. And, and I love these moments. Sometimes, you know, my son uh, was saw the newspaper the other day, and there was a big, there was an ad somewhere for basketball. And he said, Look, mom, this is look, they've advertised the basketball and the women's basketball. That's crazy. It should be just, you know, men's basketball and women's basketball. And when he noticed that, I thought, yes, that's excellent. I was very happy. So um, it's it's those kind of things when I'm when I'm trying to raise my boys that they're just kind of aware of it and and just see it as a as a thing that we should be fair and equal to all people. Fernanda has another question. Yes, from Cristina Lopez. Although it's paid by the government, how do companies react to such longer parental leaves? We hear a lot, especially from smaller companies, that business has to go on and they don't have the privilege of doing business without their staff or to hire new people to cover during the leave? What are your yeah. impressions? It's a great question and, and, and very true. And it's a challenge. Um, so one advantage is that here in Iceland, the parental leave is paid for by the government. So uh, a small company, for instance, isn't paying this person's salary while they're on leave. Uh, but you're absolutely right that they are paying uh, you know, the replacement person's, you know, salary, and they have to train that person. And there is this whole institutional knowledge that is there. Um, and that is a challenge, as you say, especially for small companies. Um, one of the areas that I think helps there is the fact that this parental leave is use it or lose it. So it, 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 um, it disadvantages women less in the sense that a company doesn't think, um, I'm going to hire the man because he's not going to go off and have babies and take time off because both people would probably take time off if they had children. And now it's sort of so ingrained in society that um, people realize that, you, you know, you need another generation to, um, to, to build the society, to be paying taxes, to be paying our pensions uh, when we're older. And so uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it's just, part of how it is that the people will take the leave. I think the big difference though, as you said, they're less off the hook financially. It's more the, um, the institutional knowledge for some people. And I mean, of course, many people, especially nowadays, it's, you know, I think if you're especially someone who's in a role where your experience, your network, your contacts are unique, um, I don't think, you know, people will still answer the phone when they're on leave or something and, and, and give you a tip on something else. And, and people just sort of, work it out because they know that that is, is an important time, but uh, it's, it's absolutely a very valid question. I want to give a possibility for another question here in the audience at the IDB. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Eliza. I've been fascinated with all the discussion about parental leave. Um, here in Latin America, Parental leave for parents, for fathers, is so short that mm -hmm. I was wondering why uh, fathers do not outrage for having more parental leave. You know, and I agree. And it, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me it seems obvious. I mean, what par what father doesn't want to spend time with their children? And uh, my question. You mentioned that uh, you do not have like a r exact recipe res or formula, but I would like to ask you uh, which effort of all what you have put into place has taken the most time, but it's like critical to further gender okay. equality. Thank you. 
just a small question. Very easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I think so in terms of the one thing that has made the biggest change, I would say it's that uh, it's the if it's combined. It's the those parental things, the parental leave and the affordable child care have made a huge difference. Um, so the affordable child care means that it's also heavily subsidized. So it costs very, very little um, to send your children. And there's more subsidies if you're a single parent or a student or, or on benefits or something like that. It's part of the sort of, you know, social uh, Nordic welfare state model. This is common throughout the Nordic countries. Um, so that is kind of one thing. And then the other thing, and again, which I try to emphasize as well, because I feel like if it's just a policy issue and I'm doing this talk to you and you would say, but that's great, but I'm not a politician. I'm not going to be, I'm not putting forward a law and I can vote or not vote based on something, but what can I actually, actually do? And, and that's where I, again, try to emphasize. And I, I hope that that's helpful here that, you know, we push to make a societal change of, of what is acceptable or what is normal in terms of the, in, in terms of the, the discourse. And, you know, here, if I, uh, if, if you wrote a, uh, if you had a panel on a big uh, corporate event, and it was all men, people would write about that in the newspaper. And, uh, it, you know, because it would just be completely unacceptable to do something like that. If you had an award show on television, and the presenters were mostly men, that would be unacceptable, there could be complaints in terms of what you had to do about it. It still happens. Um, and, and, but it, it happens and there's kind of, uh, out, outrage about it. Um, I'll give you a really small example. And again, I do want to emphasize that I know that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is a small thing. Um, uh, but I also know that it, in some, sometimes we do need to point out the small things in order to make the changes. And it had to do with, um, about a year ago, I guess we had a visit from the Prince of Denmark, uh, to Iceland for dinner. And at the presidential residence and the photo on the front of the newspaper the next day, the, the main image was uh, happened to be when he came in, he was shaking my hand and my husband, the president was standing behind us. And the photo caption said the Prince of the president of Iceland welcomed the Prince of Denmark to a dinner last night. Uh, the foreign minister of Denmark, who is a man was traveling with the Prince and the foreign minister isn't even in the picture. So this image caption talked about all the men uh, and never mentioned any woman, me at all, even though I was the main person in the photo. And again, I am not personally insulted by that. And I don't think the newspaper thought, aha, we'll deliberately not mention the first lady here. Very sneaky of us. It just didn't occur to people. And so I kind of gently pointed something out in a Facebook post and it went, um, all the news media picked it up and, and the newspaper called and apologized to me. And it's a very small thing, of course, and I, it absolutely wasn't meant personally, but it just happens very often uh, that we see photos, for instance, and women aren't mentioned in photo captions, or they're mentioned in relation to a man, you know, so-and-so's wife is having a baby or so, you know, and, um, and if we can sometimes point that out a little bit, uh, I, it, you know, I think that it starts to, to sort of sink in eventually. Okay, are there any additional questions here in the audience or the virtual audience? Let me let me ask another question, an additional one. Secrets of the Sprachar is really an inspiring book that not only shows why Iceland is a country that consistently ranks at the top for gender equality in the world, but it also showcases the lives of, you could say, ordinary women that through their work, commitment, and passion for what they do, for their families and for their societies have built a more equal country for men and women. And that's part of what I believe it's very interesting about the book. The chapter on sorority is really inspiring. Although this sorority emerges from the bottom up and you have already discussed that, women helping women in many dimensions, how can we promote more sorority in our societies? How can we create this collective sense of trying to achieve gender equality that Mm -hmm. I believe is quite present in the book and it's quite present in Iceland from, from what you write in the book. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's often we hear the stories that women aren't women's best friends, you know, that we sometimes are trying to compete with each other um, because there's maybe a small pie and so we all want our share or something. But I think really um, we stand to be each other's biggest champions, whether that is when we're sitting in a meeting and you hear the story about the guy, a woman who makes a suggestion and then a man makes a suggestion five minutes later and he gets all the credit, you know, just remembering that if a woman makes a suggestion, I can say, you know, 
I, I, I really like what Elena just said there now. Let's, let's, let's repeat that to just um, having the opportunity to, to use our voices. And, you know, that message in, in that chapter, when I talk about these sort of female friendships, you know, a lot of that had to do with this message of like carving out space for yourself. Um, you know, as they say, they're putting the oxygen mask on yourself before assisting others, knowing that we often, uh, as women spread ourselves very thin, often put a lot of responsibilities on our shoulders. And I think that there, and I think there's this unfair expectation that we have to do it all, that we have to, uh, you know, if we want to be strong, modern women, we have to look amazing and have a really successful, amazing job and a fantastic partner and a perfect house. And, and, you know, nobody can do everything all at once. And, and we have to kind of be realistic about that and support each other and, and feel confident in, in, uh, in our strengths and in our weaknesses and, 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 and in the, the pace of change and, and what we're doing and, and push our comfort levels, but also feel comfortable in our own skin. Which I think is very important for women, especially for younger women who know that they can rely on each other, not only of women in the same or of their same age, but of mm -hmm. uh, women that are more senior that can help and that can support them throughout their professional career and throughout really what they are going through. I think that's very important for us women to understand. And I believe as we age, <laughs> we understand it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You are originally from Canada, and Canada is also a country with a lot of progress in terms of gender equality, especially when compared to other developed countries. However, your book, uh, you, in the book, it seems that Iceland is playing on a completely different field when it comes to closing gender gaps. Mm -hmm. After living in Iceland for so many years and researching about gender equality, what do you think other countries like Canada, but also mm -hmm. countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, should mm -hmm. prioritize to make more progress to close mm -hmm. gender gap? Mm -hmm. Besides mm -hmm. what we have already talked about, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the policies are important. I'm because I'm serving in this role of first lady. I'm always a bit hesitant. It's not, I it's not my role to tell another country what kind of laws they should be passing. Um, but I think, and and if that's maybe one message, it's to encourage everybody to push their comfort zones by using their voices and to lift up the voices of other people. So if you are maybe a man who is paying attention to this and know this, and hopefully you walk away being convinced that working towards this greater equality is something that will, you know, enhance things for everybody. And maybe uh, keep that in mind when you're when you are um, running a meeting next time or doing something next time. And also for the women as well to kind of uh, feel comfortable with, uh, with not trying to live up to too many unrealistic standards and to support each other. I think, as I mentioned, what you said, Ana Maria, this idea of of mentoring of role models is so important. And then just, you know, to go for it. I think uh, if you're thinking of, of, of running for office, for example, I have such tremendous respect uh, for people who do that. And um, let's have each other's backs if they're going to do that. And, and remember that too in the social media, in the comment section, it's a horrible area, but it's good if we stick up for each other. Yes, definitely. That's very important. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and need to finish this inspiring conversation. Eliza, I hope you visit us in the in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Uh, the Caribbean Sea is much more warm than, than the Iceland one, so you can come and visit us. It's, just, it's also a beautiful region. Thank you very much for sharing all this knowledge and information with us. And thank you for, as you write at the end of your book, using your voice to amplify our voices to demand our spaces and to forcefully show that equality is our right, as you mentioned at the end of the book. LAC and the world can learn from Iceland policies to continue working towards closing gender gaps. The IDB is committed to supporting the region to work on this matter. Gender is really a priority issue in our vision 2025, and as such, the bank has been supporting member countries to bridge, to bridge really these gender gaps, both through investment loans and technical corporations, focused specifically on gender issues, but also by mainstreaming gender-related activities in other sectors, such as infrastructure, finance, and health, among many other issues. We hope this conversation has inspired not only the specialists of the bank, but also people in the region to continue working for more equal opportunities for men and for women. Before we go, I would like to share with you the link to Eliza's book, which you can find in the chat or using the QR code 
on the screen. And I also would like to invite you to answer a very quick survey to help us with the designing of future sessions. You can use the QR code you see on the screen or click on the link we have just shared in the chat. It takes less than one minute to respond, but it's very important for us. Thank you so much, Eliza. It was a pleasure to have you here today. We hope we have you one day in person. And thank you to our in-person and virtual audience for participating today and for checking out our at IDB Economy Academy. Pardon. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure. And exactly, I, I hope to have the opportunity to visit your region in person sometime in the future. Yes, we hope you visit us soon. Thank that would you be very lovely. much to everybody. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.